our communications director. Uh, and Sarah Guggenheimer is also right uh, Ethan Morehouse, our Deputy Operations Director and Town Leader. in my car, and I'd like to get back to Manchester before 2 in the morning. <laughs> so he, he will gladly write his email address out to you uh, and give it to you, and you can uh, have a wonderful meetup later on and have a great in-depth conversation. Um, so uh, thank you for, for coming. Um, everyone should have received a note card. Is there anyone who wanted to write a question that forgot or still has it in their hand or just realized suddenly that they do want to ask a question after all? Do you have a card? I don't. You don't. Okay. Uh, Amy Kennedy will take care of you. Um, the order was by draw just a few moments ago. I don't know if you saw uh, the Russian people uh, up in uh, front uh, of here. Um, the timekeepers have something a little different than what we had in enforcement because uh, I would start saying thank you um, and uh, it sounded like I was interrupting. So instead, we got something much nicer. We have a bell <laughs> that will, uh, Ethan will clang very loudly when you go over here. Um, is that better than me saying thank you? Yes. <laughs> um, so we're gonna start uh, with opening statements of three minutes. Starting with Karen, all the way to Levy. Uh, then we are going, once they're done, they're going to we're going to start with uh, questions. And we'll start, Declan will get the first question and we'll rotate back. Um, and they'll have two minutes to answer each question. Um, now, other candidates can also opt to, to answer that question as well. Um, well, I thought it was really clear before Portsmouth, it was very clear that I was not clear. <laughs> <laughs> but what the point is that every, this is built for supreme fairness, that everyone's going to have the exact amount of time. So if you're quick with the draw and you want to answer everyone's question, that means you're going to get less questions at the end. Because everyone is just to have the same exact amount of time at the microphone. So there, it doesn't matter how aggressive or how non aggressive you are, you're all going to be speaking the exact uh, amount of time. So each person will have up to two minutes as well. Mr. Um, Chairman, are we going to have an invocation and a pledge by one of our veterans for this? Well, we're, we're, I still got lots of stuff to talk about. Well, we don't need to talk about it. We need to talk. <laughs> well, I think you would like to know how it works. Um, so Amy and Sarah are going to be keep, keeping a notepad. I would oh, encourage the right. candidates to also maybe do a little hashtag on a little piece of paper in front of them uh, so that they also monitor it because I know some of them uh, did not realize that they had talked a lot. Uh, and so at the end, when they were not allowed to speak anymore, they were upset. So um, I would recommend if you have a piece of paper in your wallet, your pocket, um, and just do a little hashtag so you can also keep uh, track of that. Um, so uh, the closing will start with Levy and work way back, and that will be at 8 o'clock with two minutes uh, each. Um, and we should, as I said, end at the same amount of time for the closing. Uh, and this is really designed because there are so often uh, you go to these sorts of debates. Uh, and uh, the moderator is often a, a reporter or a press person or somebody who just wants to have a couple of people speak and they leave the left of the people are just sitting there and that's not fairness, that's not the way we want to run We want to make sure that everyone has an absolute opportunity to address uh, your concerns. Um, I do want to uh, say before we do the pledge um, that uh, on Sunday, I don't know if you all saw, the CBS analysis about who's going to win control of the U.S. Congress. Anyone see that? No. Well, their prediction was that we were going to win the majority <laughs> by one vote. Oh. One seat. This seat. So, the point of even bringing that up is 
yay, we can win the majority, yay, we can win this, but folks, we only have eight weeks between the primary and the general election. And if you all get on your Facebook pages and your Twitter accounts and start thinking the best way you can help your candidate is to rip the living uh, stuffing <laughs> out of somebody else, you're only creating bad luck. And I have been around long enough where we have lost major races by a very less than 1% because there was bad blood from that short primary. We don't have election of like having a primary in June or in March or some of these other states. So it is critically important uh, that you all understand that saying something positive about your candidate and horrible about the Republican candidates is really the best. So with that, uh, why don't you leave us the pledge of allegiance? Okay. There you go. We got one there, one there. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, so back, we've got the open space. Hello, I'm Terrence Moore. With the exception of President Obama's two victories, for the most part, the last decade has been a disaster electorally for Democrats, both here at home and nationally. So we need to ask ourselves, what is the Democratic Party? What does our party stand for? History tells us plainly that the Democratic Party was formed almost 200 years ago to act as a counterbalance on behalf of the people against the power of concentrated wealth. In particular, the party was formed to push back against the unchecked power of big banks, corporations, and special interests. The party carried that idea forward by passing the progressive income tax under Woodrow Wilson, passing banking regulations after the Great Depression, including Glass-Steagall. And in fact, FDR's first fireside chat was about banking regulation. The party went on to champion and deliver Social Security, the minimum wage, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Great Society. However, following the disaster of Vietnam, the party found itself largely shut out of presidential politics. That caused an unfortunate power vacuum, and into that vacuum walked the Rockefeller Republicans and the limousine liberals freshly booted from their own party. They shifted the Democratic Party away from its populist roots and into the arms of Wall Street and big money. The Democratic Party began to mix social liberalism with laissez-faire capitalism. In doing so, the party had moderate success at the presidential level, but began to be wiped out as a force at the state level and in the congressional elections. Why? Because everyday people have no idea what this party stands for. But they instinctively know that it doesn't stand for them and it doesn't care about them. How do we change this? By actually being Democrats. This means electing candidates that believe in truly universal, not-for-profit health care as a guaranteed right of citizenship, that believe in protecting your pocketbooks and your jobs from the insatiable greed of Wall Street, that believe that products that are made by slave laborers overseas should not be sold in American markets, that believe that we can rebuild our infrastructure and our manufacturing base to recreate and reclaim the lost middle class, that believe in ending endless wars abroad and being true peacemakers, and that believe, as Bobby Kennedy said, that government belongs where evil needs an adversary and there are people in distress. I am such a candidate. I ask you to join me in reclaiming our party's historic populist mantle. We must ring out a clarion call to the people and ask them to rejoin us in our endless struggle against the power of unfettered capital. If we do that, we will win and we will change the world for the better. Thank you. One, I'm a husband to a beautiful wife that I'm lucky every day to wake up next to. 
But one day, I woke up, August 4th, 2014, and she told me she couldn't feel her arms or her legs. And we found out just how sharp the sharp end of the healthcare system is, even when you have good insurance. We were lucky to get by because we had a credit card and family to take, it, take us back in. That's not something that anybody in this country deserves. Number two, I'm a father, and I'm really proud to be a dad, and I'm really excited about the future of my almost two-year-old daughter she has in front of us. What I am not excited about is having a conversation in three years when she starts elementary school in the same elementary school that I went to about where to hide in case of an active shooter. Yeah. And I know a kindergarten teacher is going to, to do her or his best job to make that fun for her, but that breaks my heart. Number three, I work in technology. And what that means is I work at a tech company and I started a business with my wife to help small businesses in the Seacoast. And what that allows me to see is a bit of the future what we're gonna lose with automation and, and what we're gonna gain. And it's a problem that we're not talking about here that we need to start addressing because the jobs that we think we're gonna have aren't gonna be there. And some of the jobs that we're not talking about will be need to be focused on again. And finally, fourth, I believe I am the best candidate to represent us in the general election because I am talking about the future. I am talking about what we all deserve. And if you believe like I believe that Getting sick in this country shouldn't make you go bankrupt, then I'd ask you to join this campaign. And if you believe, like I believe, that our children should be taught about coding and engineering and how to build things instead of where to hide in case of an active shooter, then I'd ask you to join this campaign. And if you believe, like I believe, that our future, we have to be able to work in it, that we can't let automation take everything away, that we have to send leaders down to Washington that understand technology, the benefits and the drawbacks, then I'd ask you to join this campaign. And if you believe in that future, lend our campaign your voice. Because it's only by taking our voices together, bringing them and rising them up, that we're gonna build a future that we all deserve. Thank you very much, I'm looking forward to your questions. And again, my name is Dago McCachron. I know it's tough to learn and pronounce. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us here and for being a part of this discussion. I think we all need to look for ways to be off the sidelines in 2018 and be encouraging our friends and neighbors and family members to do the same. I'm Chris Pappas, I'm from Manchester, I'm a lifelong resident of New Hampshire, uh, born and raised, went to public schools, uh, graduated from college to come back to New Hampshire to be a part of a 101 year old family restaurant business. I'm the fourth, in, uh, fourth generation of my family to co-own and operate the business. We've got about 230 employees. I worked alongside family members and learned everything about, I know about the world uh, from that business. I learned that it's more than about me. It's about those around you that you can have an impact on in the greater community. I learned that you should never ask anyone who works with you to do something you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. And I think right now in our democracy, we need an all hands on deck approach because what we're facing in Washington DC today is dire. It's consequential to the future of the middle class, the future of the Main Street businesses here that drive our economy in New Hampshire. And we are so, so, so much better than what Donald Trump represents. And we've got to say loudly and clearly in this election that we are better than this and that we can go forward in a way together that's going to expand opportunity for individuals across this country. You know what, as I look at this campaign, and as I move around the state of New Hampshire, I'm informed by those who work with us at our restaurant I'm informed by the case of Susan, who was diagnosed with breast cancer and who is worried that Republican attempts to meddle with the Affordable Care Act are gonna result in her family going bankrupt. You know, I'm informed in this campaign by Kelly, who lost her brother very recently to the opioid crisis, to an overdose, despite years and years of them trying to get him into a program that would work. And I'm informed by Jose, who uh, just passed his citizenship test, is excited to be a part of what this country has to offer, but is worried that the ladder is going to be pulled up right behind him. We've got to stop using immigrants, other people, as political pawns in Washington, D.C., and focus on how we can relate to one another and have a conversation about issues that are meaningful and move the ball forward for the people of New Hampshire. I've been involved in the big fights for the past several years as a member of the Executive Council. I fought tooth and nail and been, been a leading advocate for family planning funding and ensuring that we fund Planned Parenthood and the critical services that they provide for women and men across this state. I've also been a leading voice to implement Medicaid expansion. 53,000 individuals now have access to that coverage because of the work we did on the Executive Council. And I'm proud now that that's the best tool we have to fight the opioid crisis. We are building a broad-based campaign to win this seat. 
I've been elected in one third of this district in a Republican leaning part of the district, not by shying away from who I am as a progressive, but by reaching out to those in the middle and those on the other side who often decide these elections. And I'm confident that we're gonna be able to pull together the type of coalition we need to win this district and to provide the best represent representation we can uh, for the people of New Hampshire. Look, we need a check and a balance like never before. We can't do that without winning this district. And so I look forward to your help along the way. Thank you. Thank you. in the state of New Hampshire. One is I was a firefighter for 27 years in the city of Manchester. And the other thing, I've been known as a labor leader and a leader of the progressive movement for a number of years in the state. I took the field 44 years ago, and I haven't got off the field the past 44 years. I have been fighting for working families in the state, at the bargaining table, at the state level, in the legislature, at the federal level, fighting on behalf of workers and working families. I have been fighting for health care for 40 years. I was the first person in the AFL-CIO to, to go for single-payer health care. I have been standing shoulder to shoulder with immigrant workers in this state and around the country defending the rights of immigrant workers. I am tired of seeing people treated, mistreated, and the, what's going on in our country today, locking children up, tearing them apart from their families, is absolutely wrong. I'm against the war. I've been against the Afghanistan war. 17 years we've been in the Afghanistan war. The cost of that war is ripping us apart. It's stealing our future. We shouldn't be there. Bring people home and bring them back and bring our families and unite our families again. I have been standing up and fighting for the rights of women all of my adult life. I've been standing up and, and fighting for those people whose gender has always been an issue in our state. I work with the transgender community. I work with the gay community, the lesbian community. I have worked with them all and fought for legislation so that they have the opportunity to live the way they want to live and to love who they want to love and to marry who they want to marry. That's what America is all about. I will never stop fighting for the rights of working families in this state. I am the strongest advocate. I've been in the progressive movement from the day that I signed my union card 44 years ago, and I've been at the forefront of leading and fighting and working with the progressive effort in this state of New Hampshire. I will continue to do that. I'm the most experienced person with the longest record of fighting the power in our country, and I'll do it for you in Washington as I've done it for hundreds and hundreds of people in the state of New Hampshire. Thank you. Chairman Buckley and NHDP for hosting tonight's forum. Greeny D always said, democracy is not something we have, it's something we do. So thank you all for being here tonight and doing democracy. I grew up down the road in Epping, New Hampshire. I graduated from Epping High School and went on to be a first generation college graduate. For the past 11 years, I've been working for this district as Carol Shea Porter's chief of staff and I managed two out of her four winning campaigns. I am very proud and honored to have received her endorsement to win this seat. I've been living and breathing the issues of the first district for over a decade. I decided to run because I love doing what I do, working for and fighting for the people of New Hampshire. And I believe the voters in this district want someone in Congress who gets it, who knows what it's like and will work every day for them and their families. They want someone who will stand up to them in Washington. And if you give me the great honor of serving you, I pledge to do that every day. Just like Carol, I practice campaign finance reform. This is a principle we've shared since 2006, long before Citizens United. And I won't accept a, corp a penny of corporate PAC or VC lobbyist money. I support debt-free college. We need both students and parents to be unburdened by this crippling debt. I support opting into Medicare. Also something we've talked about since 2006, we absolutely have to lower the cost of premiums and deductibles. I also believe we need an Apollo type program to solve our energy needs and end our reliance on fossil fuels. I believe in the power of the human mind and spirit. When we said we were going to go to the moon, we did. As Americans, when we say we're going to do something, we do it. 
There's a long list of things I've worked on as Chief of Staff and that I pledge to continue working on as the next member of Congress. I also know something about fighting to keep the American dream alive. My parents instilled in me a strong work ethic. They both work hard, they both work hard blue collar jobs, and I learned from both of them the value of hard work and the value of a dollar. I know every inch of this district through my work as in the congressional office, but I also know this beautiful state because of my love for the outdoors. My father, brother, and I have hiked all 48 4,000 foot mountains in New Hampshire. I've skied, <laughs> biked, camped, kayaked all throughout the state. And most days, my dogs and I can be found somewhere breathtaking by sunrise. I take full advantage of our beautiful state. I have the experience, the enthusiasm, and commitment to serve the people of this district that I love so much. I look forward to our conversations this evening, and I hope to earn your support on primary day, September 11th. I'm Lincoln Soldati. I began my activism in 1968, protesting the Vietnam War. In 1969, I was drafted and continued to speak out while serving for the U.S. Army. I've opposed every war since. In early 2016, I went to the West Bank to mentor Palestinian public defenders. In November, I drove to the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota to fight for the water rights of the Sioux Nation. I served nine terms, that's 18 years in Stratford County Attorney eight years on the Summersworth School Board. I was elected to the Charter Commission and as the mayor of Summersworth, the city my grandfather emigrated to from Italy. And that's more elections won than all other candidates combined. <laughs> New Hampshire has been my home my entire life, and I've never needed to conduct a poll to know what issues are important to me, my community, or my district because I've been listening to the people of this district for over 25 years as an elected official and for decades more as a neighbor and a professional serving my community. I've been a trial lawyer for nearly 40 years and I've taken on systemic change. I helped transform the way the system treated survivors of sexual assault and child abuse by creating a victim assistance program that ended subjecting victims to multiple interviews, curbed the practice of using prior sexual history to embarrass victims, and halted the humiliation of charging victims for the cost of their rape kit examinations. The protocol we developed is now a statewide standard. I was the only prosecutor to testify for the repeal of New Hampshire's death penalty. I've never made a decision as an elected official based on political expediency, and I don't intend to start now. As a prosecutor and defense attorney, I've experienced issues from both sides. I know when to compromise and when you must fight for your principles. There are many issues of importance. My priorities are climate change, income inequality, and our broken health care system. Single payer, Medicare for all, is the only sensible, achievable solution. I intend to make it a national priority. But don't let anyone tell you it's not doable. It's the only thing that is. But we can only do this if we work together. To make this a reality, I need your support and your vote. If you want real change, I'm here to be your voice in Washington. Thank you very much. My name is Lincoln Soldati, and I'm running for Congress. <laughs> My two grandfathers both served in World War II, one in the Army Air Corps and the other in the Navy. And my grandmothers were leaders in Jesuit education. And they raised me and my siblings in the tradition of being men and women for others. All of my siblings are involved in service professions and we were raised to serve. I'm a United States Marine and combat veteran. I fought in the Iraq War and trained in Korea and trained in Japan. And then my journey of service continued here in New England where I moved to go to graduate school. And I heard about a woman running for Congress in 2006. And she was running on her convictions. And I came and knocked on doors for her, and that was Carol Shea Porter. 
because she was running protesting a war that I fought in and knew wasn't right, and I respected that. And then in 2008, I campaigned throughout our state for Barack Obama. And I was really proud to serve for a little more than six years in the Obama administration. I was appointed by President Obama to serve at the Department of Veterans Affairs and at the Pentagon. I'm running for Congress because like all of us, why else would we be here? I love our country and I love our community. And I have never, never in my lifetime seen a moment like the one we're in our country right now. Where the fundamental principles that make us America are at risk and under attack and our democracy is at stake. That's what's at stake in this election. You know, when I travel throughout our state and listen to people, I hear from people that we need to stand up to this president when he threatens our democracy, that health care is too expensive, that the opioid epidemic is devastating our state. I hear from grandparents, and I hear from parents that they're worried about sending their children to school because of gun violence. These are issues that I have been working on and fighting for for most of my adult life, and at times at the highest levels of the federal government. And I am ready to step up again and serve and lead and advocate for each of you and your families and our community and hit the ground running on day one and be a tireless and effective advocate for our state. But I cannot do this without your help. I cannot do it. I need all of us to come together and rise above this chaos in our politics and work together and get this done. So I'm here tonight to ask for your support and your vote. Thank you. My name is Levy Sanders. I've lived in uh, America for 15 years. I have three unbelievably beautiful children, as well as an extraordinary wife. Uh, this election is, is really, as uh, so many people have articulated, is so extraordinarily important. We have a real opportunity in 2018 to take back the House, as well as defeat a pathological liar in Donald Trump. Donald Trump couldn't find the truth, even if he was armed with a GPS. <laughs> but it's not enough for us to take on Donald Trump and attack Donald Trump. We need, as Democrats, talk about why folks should vote for us. I respectfully disagree with um, some who indicated that we need to take on the Republicans right now. No. We need to bring folks together whether Democrat or Republican or undeclared voters. That is absolutely essential. We simply, we have a situation that regardless of who wins the primary, they have to win the general. That means that we need to talk about the issue of guns. And why is it that so many people have profound levels of anxiety regarding gun issues? We have to reach out to folks that are, go, oh my goodness, that's right, Donald Trump supporters. We have to start sweating, we have to get nervous, and we have to reach out to these folks because these folks are in our community and they vote. It is essential ultimately that we have a Medicare for all health care system that guarantees health care to every man, woman, and child without out-of-pocket expenses. Some of these folks here do not believe in a Medicare for all health care system. I think that's absolutely outrageous. Anybody who doesn't believe in a Medicare for all health care system should not be running for Congress. The stakes are just too high. I talk, I just talked to an unbelievable woman, uh, 25 years old, you know, I don't go very much to Walmart, one time when I do go to Walmart, I talk, and, and they, she, she's so anxious about going to the doctor because she's terrified, ultimately, what that's going to entail. That if she goes there, that she's gonna have a, you know, an extraordinarily high deductible co-payment premium, and she's gonna be, you know, she's, she's not going to go to afford it. Another issue I want to talk about is tuition free public colleges and universities. As everybody knows, University of New Hampshire is $40,000 to go there. I talked to so many people who just say, let me, why, why should I even go to college? I'm going to be deeply in debt. So we need to have that. But in addition, we need to have it in terms of, at 3% in terms of what folks are paying back in terms of their college loans. I only have a few more minutes, I know it's me, but in terms of paid equity for women. Women on average make 79 cents to the dollar. We are in 2018. This is simply obscene. So I'm happy to talk to you guys, but those are the, those are the fundamental issues which I think is just so critical and important. Thank you very much.
Conservation, restoration, stewardship of our natural resources. Um, for those of you who came tonight to find out uh, where I stand on the issues, I can assure you that I am committed to campaign finance reform. We will not take one cent from tax. And citizens are my special interest, and my campaign is walking the walk, not just talking the talk. She supports $15 uh, dollar minimum wage or higher, single payer Medicare for all, fair education for preschools at grade 16. Um, like at the State House, she will continue to fight against attempts to limit women's access to reproductive health care and against racism and hate. Uh, she will also continue to fight for the rights of the mentally ill, immigrants, and LGBTQ, uh, and ask for your vote on September 11th. Uh, and you can learn more about her from her website at www.mindy.com for written out congress.com. Uh, uh, or directing questions to info at maybe for congress.com. Um, so uh, one of the things that, uh, if you can focus, uh, if the candidates can talk nearer to the microphones, because we are recording it for the press, and you want to make sure that you are accurately uh, quoted in the eloquent words. <laughs> uh, the first question is for uh, Devlin, and uh, you touched on a little bit of an opening statement. Uh, will your campaign be accepting any money from the NRA? What is your plan to address school shootings and student anxiety? You have two minutes. Great. So is it easier to stand? You guys want to see? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Right. So I always love this question of whether or not I'm going to be accepting money from the NRA as if the NRA was going to be giving <laughs> um, So we are not soliciting the NRA, and I do not believe that they are going to be giving us any money because we firmly disagree with the fundamental belief that the only way to check a government is with the Second Amendment. I believe we check our government with the First Amendment, with the ballot box, by standing up and coming together every single day, promoting a future that we want and deserve. Specifics on gun control, I know you guys want to hear that. So, I do not believe that AR-15 should be in the hands of individuals, civilians in this country. I would go back to 1986, the Federal Firearm Safety Act, as we banned M4s and M16s back then because they were not viewed in the public good and too dangerous, and we banned them. We can do that again. I furthermore believe that we should expand background checks, uh, we should close gun control loopholes, we should have red flag laws, we should ban bump stocks, as well as high capacity magazines. When I'm trying to differentiate, I, I think I am the only candidate that understands we're not gonna get every single gun off of the streets. There's four to nine million AR-15s. That's a lot of guns buried in the desert that we don't know about. So I am supporting a background check on bullets, specifically 223 high velocity ammunition, because I believe that you should be, if you bought an AR-15 10 years ago, you should still be subject to a background check if you want to buy 200 rounds of ammunition for that gun. I think that is a good way that we could prevent some of these atrocities from happening. Uh, I'm happy to talk about more specifics, but in broad strokes, I am a supporter of making sure that my daughter doesn't have to fear in the same way that we do right now. So thank you. As I said at the beginning, just to reiterate, uh, the candidates can choose to address another other person's question, but it comes against their social time. Chris. Mm -hmm. 
to thank you. You know, the proudest grade I received was when I received my F from the NRA back when I was in the legislature. Uh, or that with a badge of honor. Look, we're not going to take any money or any support from the NRA. They represent the industry. They don't well represent the gun owners of this country because even some gun owners I speak to know we have to take common sense steps that can take some of these weapons of war off the street and save lives. Um, I'm committed to supporting the assault weapons ban, uh, reinstituting it, ensuring that we don't have weapons like the AR-15 floating around on our streets. In addition to that, we need universal background checks. 95% of the public supports universal background checks. I can't think of another issue where we can that, get that kind of a broad consensus. But the fact that we don't see any action in Congress when there's tragedy after tragedy, when lives are lost in schools and churches, in so many other public venues, is because the NRA has a stranglehold. It's because that special interest, that big money comes into play and prevents us from being able to do something very basic. So we need to change the dynamics of Congress. Uh, we need a Democratic majority so that these ideas can come forward for a vote. Um, and I also support ensuring that we ban high capacity magazines and bump stocks and some of the other devices that have taken an act of violence and turned it into an act of mass slaughter. Look, this is very basic. As elected officials, we should be promoting and protecting public safety. So this is something that I'm going to be talking about aggressively in this campaign. Um, as a result, we're supported by the Gabby Giffords Committee. In addition, the Pride Fund to End Gun Violence, we've received the Mom Demands Action stamp of approval in this campaign. I think we've got to make sure that we continue to press this issue, that we lift up the voices of the students uh, here at Kennett and lots of other schools that we're hearing from uh, where the students are saying enough is enough, the adults have failed us, Let's give uh, space for their voice and make sure we don't let these issues slip from the headlines yet again without doing something about it. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? You know, um, as a person who served in the military, I, I go to bed pretty early and I get up pretty early in the morning. Uh, still stay with me after all these years. Uh, and I'll tell you, not that long ago, one of our house parties, a 10-year-old girl uh, was on the seacoast, came up to me and said she was worried about going to school because of gun violence. And that's what I was going to do about it if I was elected to Congress. And I'll tell you, I didn't fall asleep until about 12.30 that night, and that's pretty late for me. And I wish that that was an isolated story or incident, but we all know that it's not. Look, I have a lot of experience with weapons. I spent the greater part of 2005 with a 9mm pistol strapped to my right thigh, a little bit west of Baghdad, that I was issued by the United States Marine Corps for personal protection. Part of my job as Marines was overseeing the state storage of weapons. And as a Marine, you train on many weapon systems. I've fired machine guns, I've cleaned them, I've assembled them, I've disassembled them, I know them inside and out. And I know that they do not belong anywhere in our state and anywhere in our country. And if I were in Congress right now, not only would I would be voting for an assault weapons ban and banning high capacity magazines and bump stacks, I would be introducing it on the House floor. Because children should not be afraid to go to school and teachers should be focused on teaching. And I know I will not take a dime from the NRA and I'm very proud to publicly say that. Thank you. Thank you. Just a word on universal background checks. We know that there is support for them. We know right now that it's not fair. If you went to the airport tomorrow and they said only one out of four of you in line have to go through TSA um, screening, you would say that's not fair. Well, that's currently how our, universe, uh, how our background system works. We need to close the loopholes and have a universal background system. Magazine capacity. I have friends and family who are hunters and some of them rely on that venison to get them through the winter. But those friends that are hunters have said to me, if I can't shoot a deer in 10 rounds, I probably shouldn't be out there. <laughs> so we can limit magazine capacity. Um, our office, we served on the Gun Violence Pre Prevention Task Force. I would join that on day one and introduce any legislation for common sense gun violence reform. Um, but the NRA is too powerful and we do need a Democratic majority. Speaker Ryan has been terrible on this issue. Do you guys remember when the Dems staged a sit-in on the House floor? Do you know that all they wanted was a vote so that terrorists who are currently barred from flying could be prevented from buying a gun? And instead of allowing for a vote to happen, Speaker Ryan threatened sanctions 
on the House Democrats. So we know that we need change in Washington, and that this is an issue very important to me, and I will fight hard for it. Thank you. Yeah, I echo everything everybody else is saying. Um, uh, having uh, three children, we talk about this issue, and uh, man, wow, the anxiety these children are under uh, in 2018 is, is just quite remarkable. Uh, you know, uh, the fear of, of having to go to school, uh, figure out where exactly uh, you're going to hide under your desk, uh, in a closet, what have you. Uh, you know, uh, even the teachers, the teachers want to teach. This is, the, this is a, a, a huge issue. <laughs> the problem, ultimately, though, that none of these folks are talking about is that we need, again, we need to reach out to law-abiding gun owners. 95% of these folks believe in a background check. The, the, the NRA is 5 million people. That's it, 5 million. But they have been able to take this issue because the Democratic Party has not done a good job about reaching out to low-income, working-class folks who basically are very, very anxious, extraordinarily anxious. Barack Obama, who I've talked to on a couple of occasions, talked about the issue that Republicans and conservatives cling to their guns and to their religion. And he's absolutely right. And this is misconstrued. But the reality is, for so many folks, they are at their wit's end. They're losing their jobs. Uh, you know, we need a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Uh, they don't. They can't afford to pay uh, for college. We can go on and on. But the fundamental question we need to do, and I've talked to people, are very anxious. They're losing their rights, and we need to address this issue. So I hope you know when we talk about this issue that we reach out to everyone. Uh, on this issue because it's a very, very complicated issue. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe the uh, original question was, would you accept money from the NRA? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, that was a pretty easy one. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to assume that most people in this room have a driver's license. The reason you have a driver's license is you had to take a test before you were permitted legally to operate an automobile. Now, why is that? Well, that's because under the law, a motor vehicle is considered a dangerous instrumentality. You know what else is a dangerous instrumentality? A firearm. So why wouldn't it be just as reasonable to ask that before somebody can purchase or own a firearm, that they demonstrate the ability to operate that firearm correctly, to store it safely, etc.? Nothing unreasonable about that. There's nothing in the Constitution that prevents that. You know, you all are okay with uh, with getting your driver's license. That's not an unreasonable request. Uh, like uh, a few others on this panel, I have uh, received the distinction from the uh, 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 Moms uh, Group for uh, Action, Demand Action. Uh, I also would uh, call for universal background checks. I'd ask for a waiting period as well. I would save a lot of people who are committing suicides with guns. Um, when I got married, we had to have a waiting period. <laughs> so I don't think that's unreasonable either. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. We had to wait a week, I'm telling you. Um, I also think we ought to uh, outlaw uh, large capacity magazines. There's, uh, there's really uh, nothing special about that. And we have. Uh, in the past, I bought uh, assault weapons, had an assault weapons ban. Uh, nobody seemed to suffer terribly from that. So uh, there are a lot of reasonable things we could do. Uh, and I, I think uh, the time is right. How do we know that? Florida. Florida. Thank you. Uh, next question. This one will be addressed to Chris Pappas. Uh, what will you do uh, as a member of Congress to address racial other Thank you. I, I think we all have to be cognizant of the fact that there is widespread inherent discrimination that exists in communities here in New Hampshire and across this country. Um, New Hampshire is a fairly white state overall. 
but we do have racial and ethnic minorities in our state that we have to ensure are part of our economy and are a part of the heart and soul of what our communities represent. Um, in the Manchester area, I've worked closely with the refugee community, um, with the new American community that is bringing a new dynamic uh, and a new dimension to what our city and our state is all about. And I'm glad that they're here. We employ many new Americans at my restaurant in Manchester, and I've gotten to know the larger communities, whether it's the Nepali community, whether it's the Salvadoran community, um, you name it. And I think that we need an elected official that's gonna stand up for these individuals as their status is questioned by the Trump administration and as the divider in chief that is in the White House seeks to pit groups of Americans against one another. We also have to ensure that the laws respect each and every person. As someone who would become the first LGBT member of our delegation in Congress, I know that we have a ways to go to ensuring that everyone is protected under the law and that's why we need to make sure we add the LGBTQ community to um, our anti-discrimination laws nationally and ensuring that people aren't discriminated against in housing, employment, um, and public accommodations. But I think that this country does best when we stick to our values, where everyone is included and where we bring more people in from the margins into what this country is all about. We all win. So that, that goes for economically as well as socially. And I think we have a ways to go, even in the state of New Hampshire, to make sure more people are included, respected, um, and that we look out for the dignity of each and every person. struggle between people who think somehow that the world is not going to change. And as a result of that, we have a whole lot of people who are trying to hold back immigrants coming into this country. Now, what are they doing? They're arresting them. They're arresting them not far from here, I might add. In Thornton, uh, welcome to New Hampshire. Bienvenue. Come to our state. Enjoy our mountains. As soon as you see them, we're going to pull you over and arrest you. They're dragging children away from their, from their moms and dads and somehow justifying that by saying, well, they're criminals. They're not criminals. They're decent American people. And what they are deflecting this, uh, they're deflecting from the argument is that immigration reform needs to happen in, the, in America. We have 3.8% unemployment rate in our nation. We need the immigrants from around the world to come to our country to fuel our economy, to work and to, and to strengthen our economy. If we close the doors, we're going to shut down the American economy, and sooner or later, people are going to have to recognize that. Be fair. Stop discriminating against them, and stop locking them up, and stop pulling families apart. It's not the American way. It's not what we fight for. It's not what we stand for. And they're doing it, and it's wrong. And I would stand up, as I always have, and defend the immigrants of our country and the immigrants of this nation. That's what I've done, and that's what I'll continue to do. Thank you. I believe the uh, question was, what would you do for race relations? One of the first things I would do is reauthorize uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, that has been stripped by the Supreme Court in recent years. And in terms of voting rights, I'd go one step further. Uh, I would ask for universal voter registration from either birth or naturalization. You know, uh, I remember when we had selective service. I guess we still do, sort of. But, uh, and I can tell you this, when I turned 18, the government knew where I was. <laughs> so if we had universal registration, when you turn 18, you get a little notice that says, by the way, you're registered to vote. Get down to your town clerk and give them your address. Everybody in this country should be registered to vote. The only reason to work for voter suppression, which we see a great deal of, uh, not only in this state but across this nation, is because you have bankrupt ideas, because you don't believe the majority of people would support your ideas. Uh, and that's why Democrats need to support universal voter registration. That's the first thing I would, uh, uh, I would do with respect to voter issues. Thank you. Next question is, is 
address, or we'll be, we'll be addressed tomorrow, but just as a member. Um, as a member of Congress, how will you address climate change? Sure, uh, you know, for me, I've been saying for a long time that we need to stop poisoning the air we, we breathe. The water we drink in the soil that we grow our food in. Part of that is recognizing that climate change is real, that it's here, that it's in our face, that, that 100 years or 50 years is not a long time in the history of this, of this earth. So we need to address the fact and stipulate to the fact that the world is changing, the weather is changing, we're poisoning the, everything around us in this, in this world. Start the process of weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels by 2050 and, and put in place a carbon tax to uh, disincentivize the, uh, the oil industry, expand uh, thermal and wind and solar energy and build it in a way that does not leave the workers of this country behind, which is a collision that happens over and over again between the environmentalists and those people who are, who are trying to work each and every day. People will come, workers will come, they'll come to the table as will other environmentalists come to the table. And we need to stipulate on this issue and others that we share common ground on this issue. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent or you don't believe in anything, if you can't breathe the air when you walk out of your house, we have a real problem on our hands. We need to solve this problem. We can do it. I have brought people together in communities, in legislative, in legislative issues, in political issues, in collective bargaining issues. I've led the fight over and over. I can bring people together. That's what I bring to this fight, and that's what I'll do on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. So there's probably not a whole lot of people that were a fan of Northern Pass up here, I'm guessing. Now, we fought against Northern Pass by saying it was going to tear up the, the North Country, it was going to decimate tourism, and it was going to be an eyesore and a blight. And I'm glad that that argument worked. I am glad that most people woke up to the fact that we don't want high transmission power lines coming down from Hydro-Quebec into Massachusetts and cutting through our White Mountains. I'm a fan of that. But I'm a fan of that because it prevented a bigger problem from happening. And that's what, it would have been a continuation of our reliance on a centralized power distribution. And I'm not gonna take that as my bell. <laughs> a centralized power distribution. We have to move away from that if we ever want solar to take on. We can't be building, and you know, my father fought in Seabrook in the 80s. And we lost that fight, and so we had Seabrook bonded out for 30, 40 years, and now the concrete is crumbling there. If we had Northern Pass and we had bonded that out, we would have not been able to move off of centralized power in our lifetime. That would have been a problem, because solar wins when it's decentralized. Solar has a tougher time winning when it's not, when it's centralized, because it's harder to fit all those solar rays in there. To that point, I also support a carbon tax, because I don't think we do what we ought to do we do what we need to do. And if you look in the last 40 years of looking to try to figure out what modulates human behavior when it comes to electricity demand and usage, the only thing that correlates is the electric bill. We have more and more lights in our house than we've ever had before. As efficiency has gone up, usage has remained the same because we put more in there. We need to start thinking about this and all the externalities, the death that this causes, the pollution to our planet, everything that we can be wrapping into a carbon tax. Thank you. So um, oftentimes when people talk about climate change, they'll say that the earth is dying. Well, the, the earth isn't dying. Uh, the earth is gonna be just fine. What's happening is the earth's ability to maintain human life is gonna go away. The History Channel actually had a show on this a few years ago that says, what happens after we're gone? Apparently cephalopods are gonna be the next big thing. So if we want to maintain human life on Earth, we have to act right now and reduce the carbon going into our atmosphere. <clears throat> the first thing we should do in America is have a nationwide cap and trade. And why can we, can, can, we can cap and trade work other things that failed in the past? Well, it's a bipartisan idea. And why is it a bipartisan idea? It was a Republican idea in the, in the 1980s. Uh, remember when Ronald Reagan was president? You know, this was one of their ideas. And why does it appeal to Republicans? Because it appeals to greed. And what happens in cap and trade is you innovate or you go out of business. And if I innovate, 
I have more credits to sell you who didn't innovate. I'm making more money off of you, and either you innovate or you die. So it's a market-based solution, and it's something that Republicans can buy into. The second plan I have, I call it Connect New Hampshire. It's the idea to connect everyone in New Hampshire to everyone else in America by rail and bus. And what do we know about rail and bus? They could be run electrically. And what do we know about electricity? It can be created by renewable sources, non-fossil fuel based. And what's another good effect of this? So not only are we using less fossil fuels that spew carbon into our air, what will that get us out of? It gets us out of involving in the Middle East. And the, if the Middle East, they didn't have oil there, do you think anyone would care, frankly? So the, this plan has all the, the, the right things we talk about, and it's gonna keep young people in New Hampshire. Because if young people can go to Boston and Portland and God forbid a foreign country in Montreal, <laughs> but then come back here to go to bed at night, they're gonna stay in New Hampshire and we're gonna stop hemorrhaging all our young people. First, let me make it very, very clear. I'm 100% against the NRA, just so you understand that. So there's no debate here, okay? And I will give all that money back. Second issue, let me talk about the issue of voter very quick. I'm going to move on this question. There's been 1 billion votes that are counted. 31 cases of voter fraud. Yet the Republican Party, particularly the Republican uh, in terms of party in terms of New Hampshire, thinks it's a major issue. That's the first you to understand. Obviously, one issue of voter fraud is too many, but it's not an issue. But in terms of climate change, I think we all understand in this room that climate change is caused by human activity. I think we're all in agreement with that, right? Yet yeah, Donald Trump believes that it's been concocted by the Hollywood elite. That is correct. And about 35% of America believe that. The reality, as you know, is 99.7% of scientists say that we have a very, very serious problem. And it's called climate change. The other 0.3% are actually paid off by the Republican Party. <laughs> so you, you pay about 100% of the people who understand what's going on. But the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves is why is it that we're not doing a good job about reaching out to low income, working class folks, people of color on these issues? Because it affects these folks at, at every day. We're not doing a good job. It's very important to understand what's going on uh, in you know, other, other uh, countries or whatever, but in terms of we have to tap into what's going on here in America to get people to understand what's happening. What I would suggest two things. Number one, ultimately, we need to talk to the media. We say, unacceptable. You need to start talking about this, you need to talk about that at a very serious level. And secondly, we need to have our own channel. We have to have a channel directly about the environment. So instead of rooting for the New England Patriots, which I'm a big fan of, major issue we need to talk about is the issue of the environment and stand up for all the folks that are getting destroyed in terms of the environment, even in Portsmouth, in terms of uh, the problems of water and super fun states that are having serious and significant effect folks all over New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, climate change is one of my top three priorities. Uh, and it has to be. It has to be because climate change is an existential issue for us. What does that mean? That means that it threatens our existence. You can't ignore a problem that threatens our existence. You know, if it was some asteroid we could see in the sky coming toward us, we'd all, we'd set our hair on fire, we'd all want to do everything we could to stop it. Well, we do have an asteroid, it's just we can't see it. And the biggest problem, at least for me, is that this isn't going to matter much to me. But <laughs> it, it won't, you know, I'll be gone. The fact of the matter is, it will affect my children and more importantly, my grandchildren. You know, I, you know, I, I didn't understand the issue about grandchildren, okay? I didn't. You know, I, people would say, oh, can I show you my picture of my grandchildren? I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to see that. <laughs> and then something happened. I had grandchildren, and I found it's the best thing in life. But that's really one of the reasons I'm in this. It's because this is about my grandchildren's life, the world they're going to inherit. Martin Luther King talked about the fierce urgency of now, and when it comes to climate change, it is never more true. We have to act now, because if we wait two, three, five, ten years, it'll be too late. We'll be beyond the tipping point. So this is the most urgent issue we face, and of course, with the grifter-in-chief, we have abandoned our role in the world to lead on this issue. We need to take that back. Congress has to pass laws, forget regulations, make it a federal law. Thank you.
it is. It's the number one issue on this very small planet of ours. Uh, water levels are rising, weather is chaotic, pollinators are in danger, and frankly, so are we. I mentioned we need an Apollo-type program to solve our energy needs. I believe in the power of the human mind and the determined spirit of the American people. We can do that. Do you know what agency in the federal government is best on this issue? Department of Defense, the Pentagon, they know. This is a national security issue, we can't ignore it. They're investing in renewable energy because they don't want to depend on fuel sources that are limited and also destructive. Can they talk to the other agencies and stop throwing it on them, the climate change deniers? Um, I'm appalled that this administration took us out of the power of Paris Accord. We need to be a leader on this issue. A few years back, our office actually organized to have a meeting on the top of Cannon Mountain to talk about climate change and how it's having an impact on our ski and tourism industry right here in New Hampshire. I know that we can do better, I know that we can get this done, and I promise that I will lead on this issue in Congress. Well, you know, first and foremost, I mean, I think everyone here sort of said this, but climate change is real. Uh, the risk is sort of stating the obvious. Um, I was appalled to see that this president removed climate change as a threat to national security uh, when he released his national security strategy last December. Uh, I, you know, I was proud to work in the Obama administration that got the Paris deal done. Uh, I was really proud to work uh, directly for the Secretary of the Navy, uh, introducing biofuel to our fleets of Navy ships around the world. Right now, 12% of the Navy's energy is on renewables. We've got a long way to go, but it was a really good start. Uh, look, we have abandoned our role uh, as a leader in the world on this issue. A couple things I would specifically be focused on. First, uh, we need to make sure we don't withdraw from the Paris, uh, the Paris Accord. I mean, pretty much every other country on the planet uh, is in this deal, uh, and we've chosen to withdraw from it. You know, second, we need to incentivize a clean economy. We need to protect our coast from offshore drilling, and we need to reinstate climate change as a threat to national security because it is. And that's what I would be focused on as a member of Congress. Thank you. Thank you. I support debt-free higher education. I think that the burden to students is staggering. I think it's unreal that you can get a loan for a car at even as low as 0%, yet these students are encountering interest rates of 8, 9, 10%. What I see for our tech, for two-year or four-year institution at the pub, public institution level is that it should be needs blind. That the students can apply, and if they get in to the finance, uh, to the admissions office based on their merit, then the financial aid office meets their needs so that they can come out of school debt free. You know, when Carol went to school at UNH. She worked at the Davidson Rubber Factory in Dover, and she was able to make enough to pay her tuition each semester. I worked when I was in college. I worked two summer jobs, 80 hours a week. I did work study. I worked during the school year in the library for a professor. There's no way that I could come up with the money for college. We know that the costs are out of control, and I think the best way to move forward is to have debt-free public institutions for our next generation. We know that education is quite simply the key to prosperity, and I believe we can get it done. Thank you. Well, thank you. I also believe in tuition-free community colleges and public universities because there shouldn't be barriers to entry to higher education for individuals based on their zip code or based on their income. This is something that's essential if we're going to equip our workers with the tools that they need to be a part of our economy, uh, to live healthy lives, and to provide for their families. Um, and we're one of the only industrialized nations in the world that doesn't do this. This is a particular issue of interest to us in New Hampshire. Our biggest export is our well-skilled, uh, highly talented high school students who are going off to college in other states, and it's because we price them out of a higher education here in New Hampshire. 
60% of our high school grads leave the state of New Hampshire, many of whom never to come back after college. That's something we've got to get right. You can't drive up Route 16 without seeing help wanted signs on about each and every business. Um, I've talked with a few of them today, business owners who aren't concerned particularly about their level of taxes or the level of regulation that they face as a local business. It's all about where are the young workers going to come from? I have an aging workforce. Within the next 10 years, 25% of our workforce in New Hampshire is going to be of retirement age. So we have a ticking demographic time bomb that we have got to face head on. And it's going to take not just the federal government coming in to solve this, it's got to take the state of New Hampshire standing up and stepping up to the plate because we provide the least amount of support for our public universities of any state in the country. That is not a good distinction for New Hampshire, and we're not going to be able to solve that crisis if we don't do something about it. Um, I also think that we need to make sure that we invest in apprenticeship programs and job training programs and work on the partnerships uh, with our community colleges and universities to get people right into the workforce. And we also have to encourage individuals to go into the trades. You know, there are a number of sectors that aren't well represented in New Hampshire right now in terms of students who are learning and coming up through the ranks, nursing, high tech, the trades. We need to make sure that we have a full and robust economy, and that involves making sure we don't price people out of higher education. Thank you. I also support uh, free tuition at uh, community colleges and, and state-run uh, public schools. I think we're looking at this issue a little bit backwards, though. We've been told, and in my generation as a millennial, and I think I'm the only millennial on here, I know I don't look that, um, but I've been told, I've been told there's some folks. Um, but we have been looking at this issue wrong. We've been told our entire life that, that we have to go to college, that college is the only option. Well, that option is a tough choice because of the debt that you get out of it. Now, I had a friend that I grew up with. I played, uh, I played uh, middle school football with him. And he went and he got a four-year degree. He went to Plymouth State, got a four-year degree. And he was given an option at the end of those four years because he got a psych degree. Either he goes back in and gets another two years of a master's to be able to practice in his field, or he could go become an apprentice to an electrician and become a master electrician. He chose to become a master electrician. He now owns his own home in Greenland. His name is Matt Sparks. If we can't convince guys with the last name of Sparks to become electricians in this country, we're not doing a good enough job. And the fact is, automation is going to take a lot of jobs away. And I believe that we should need that head on and have computer science taught in every single classroom from K to 12 or K to 14, and we can fund it by rolling back the tax cuts if we want to, or we could have uh, Title II money go towards that. But if we're not honest about the trades and that they pay more money, than an average four-year college degree, and that they're not gonna be automated. We are not going to find a robot that's gonna be able to sweat a copper fitting and change out a boiler anytime soon. Then we're not looking at the jobs that are right in front of us. And as Democrats, we gotta start talking about high school again. We gotta start talking about how do we improve high school in this country. Thank you. Well, I applaud the Democratic platform. Marijuana should be legalized in this state. We also ought to tax it so that we can use the, the funds uh, from that uh, to help uh, with those who are dealing with addiction. Uh, on a federal level, we ought to remove marijuana from the Schedule I uh, category and uh, allow states to make their own decisions about the legalization of uh, specifically about marijuana. So I am in uh, favor of legalizing marijuana in this state, uh, perhaps all states, but I think every state should make their own decision on that. Um, and uh, what this really underscores, however, uh, is the whole issue uh, related to drugs and the criminal justice system. 
I've uh, literally spent my entire professional life uh, within the criminal justice system, half of it as a prosecutor and half of it as a defense attorney. And it was Richard Nixon who began the war on drugs. Uh, and the fact, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Well, we've been doing the same thing since Nixon. Uh, and things have only gotten worse, nothing's improved. The criminal justice system is not the way to address issues of either addiction or related to uh, substance abuse. Uh, we need to understand that addiction is a medical, not a criminal justice issue. And this idea that we're going to uh, arrest uh, drug dealers and that's going to solve the problems is ludicrous. Uh, and I say this because, uh, as a prosecutor as well as a defense attorney. I've had uh, clients of mine that have died from, uh, from addiction, from overdoses. I've seen the problems with people sitting in jail for the only reason, the only reason, is that there wasn't a bed available for their rehabilitation because the condition of bail was that they get in rehab. And in this state, it can take 18 months to get a, to get a bed available. This is unacceptable. We need to change our whole mindset with respect to how we deal uh, with substance abuse, et cetera. Thank you. Legalization marijuana, raise your hand. So if you raise your hand, you kind of make the point, but you can still speak. But you really got a lot of great questions. Terrence, because you've had you spoken the least, so absolutely. Yes. So when I launched my campaign, legalization of marijuana was one of the, my major planks. And let me talk to you about why I believe in legalizing marijuana. First of all, it became illegal based on class and racial stereotypes. And we know that from the very beginning. And number two, once uh, uh, excuse me, alcohol became legal again, there's an entire body of law enforcement that needed something to do. And that something to do became marijuana, uh, uh, enforcing marijuana prohibition. And as someone who's been a prosecutor his entire legal career, uh, other than one year as a defense attorney, um, at both the state and federal level, there is no greater waste of resources as a prosecutor than marijuana enforcement. What we should be focusing on is going after those people on Wall Street who bottomed out our economy and are looking to do it again. And again, another thing, I was a young person not that long ago, not maybe <laughs> the time it's taken, but um, I was sitting in an audience just like y'all, and I had politicians, and it'd be Democratic politicians saying, oh, we're gonna really look at this marijuana issue, we're gonna do something about it. That wasn't true. And if a Democrat sits up here and tells you, well, we're gonna look at the issue, they're not. They're gonna keep it legal, excuse me, they're gonna keep it illegal and keep that, these foreign drugs going. So young people who we need to energize to win this election coming up and to win the election in the future, if they don't think the Democratic Party supports marijuana legalization, they're gonna look elsewhere. And believe me, because I, I was a poll monitor down in Dover during the 2016 election, there were young people who came in there and all they did was fill out the ballot for Gary Johnson. Why? Because Gary Johnson said he was going to legalize marijuana. So we lost those votes. And the only way to get it back is not only to have our party platform here in New Hampshire change, but as federal candidates, we must commit to legalizing a full legalization at the federal level. Thank you. Just, I wanted to just add, as a veteran, I've seen, and when I worked at the VA, uh, the very, very powerful medicinal effects of marijuana, and it has been game-changing in terms of care for veterans. A few people have you know, said this already, but we absolutely need to declassify it. We absolutely need to, because the focus right now uh, is too much on, on marijuana and not uh, the real challenges that we face uh, in our society. And then third and finally, the federal government should have absolutely no role in this. Uh, and what the Trump administration has done, uh, they shouldn't be doing. Uh, the federal government should have no role in it, and it should be a state decision. Thank you. Today, there's income inequality over 
Come on, that was funny. Yes. Uh, <laughs> some of us laughed. Income inequality continues to skyrocket. Even professionals with master's degrees can't earn a living wage. What would you do, you do as a member of Congress to address income inequality? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think there's a few things that uh, we need to be focused on. I mean, first and foremost, what you, you, know, you said, Chairman, income inequality is, is very, very real. And we are seeing a lot of people, even here in our state, who uh, used to be Democrats and have now voted for, for Trump. Uh, we are that party of FDR. And we've got to figure out how we lost people and start talking to them again and engaging in conversation. One of the first things I think we need to be focused on is raising the minimum wage. As we all know, we're the only state in New England where our wage is pegged to the federal minimum wage. And we can learn a lot from our neighboring states how to raise it thoughtfully and effectively. And I think that's one of the first things that we can do. Second, we need to make sure people can afford to access health care. And one of the fundamental pillars of our democracy is that everybody can afford to access health care. And that's at risk right now. So those are two of the first things that I would be focused on. Thank you. It was a great speech. And it's sad to think back on that speech and and realize that the glitter still does not sparkle in the gutter in America. I wish that wasn't applicable to New Hampshire as well. I wish that there wasn't the tale of two New Hampshires as well. I wish that there, we could look at 2.5% unemployment and applaud ourselves instead of realizing that there's too many people that can't find good paying work and there's not enough businesses allowed or able to pay enough in this, in this state. That is a problem. And it's a problem we're gonna to continue to see here in New Hampshire when we, we don't address some of the basic needs that, that we have here. On the federal level, we need to increase the earned income tax credit. We're not going to allow, we're not gonna have a universal basic income anytime soon, but, but an earned income tax credit will allow us to give more money to more people in need more quickly. And that's something that was supported by Ro Khan and something that I would support today. I also believe that we need to go to a $15 minimum wage and peg it to inflation. I do not see us, well you can clap if you want, I won't interrupt your clapping. I do not see us getting to a point where wages are gonna rise unless we do something about it. And if we look at CEO pay, that's gone up about 1100%. If we look at the cost of college tuition, that's gone up 1100%. Naomi, I would love to find out where you got your car loan because mine is a higher interest rate. I have more years on my time on that. I have a six year car loan for $450 a year. That's unbelievable that I'm gonna be paying off my car loan for that long a time. But yet our wages have risen 11% since 1980 when adjusted for inflation. That is a problem and a problem we all need to address if we want a country. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there are two dynamics at work in New Hampshire. You know, on the one hand, we're one of the healthiest states in the country, yet we're experiencing an opioid crisis that's second in the nation in terms of the number of people that we're losing. We're one of the wealthiest states in the country, yet there are too many people being left behind, and the childhood poverty rate has actually increased in our state over the last several years. And we have a homelessness problem that's really significant. Look, we've got to make sure we take bold steps to address the economic anxiety that people are feeling in communities across New Hampshire, rich and poor communities, because there are people who are struggling in each and every corner of the state of New Hampshire. We need to raise wages, we need to tie the minimum wage to inflation to ensure that people don't have to wait around for a support of Congress to get a uh, cost of living increase again in the future. We need to stop the Republican attempts to gut the Affordable Care Act and make sure that we take additional steps to make sure every man, woman, and child in this country is covered with affordable health insurance. We also have an affordable housing crisis in this country right now, and it's felt pretty acutely here in the Mount Washington Valley. You know, there are employers that can't entice workers to take a job because they can't find housing within range of their workplace. And so we need to reinvest in programs like HOME and the Community Development Block Grant to ensure that we can increase the stock of affordable housing opportunities here in New Hampshire. Excuse me. I also support ensuring that we have a system of paid leave so that individuals don't have to choose between taking care of themselves or a sick relative and losing out on a day's work. And I say this as a small businessman and an employer here in New Hampshire who employs 230 people. We all do better uh, when we look out for one another. 
and we can't sustain an economy or democracy when we have CEO pay exploding where real wages for average workers have barely budged over my lifetime. We have to do a lot better by each other, by one another, invest in the workers of this country and ensure that they can take care of their needs so that we can all move forward together and succeed. Thank you. The number one issue that we need to do is we need to end Citizens United. Yeah. Yeah. Fundamental question that needs to be asked. That is the fundamental issue that's facing us today. We have a situation right now that three people in this country own more wealth than the bottom half of America. Just think about that. Three people own more wealth than 50% of America. Secondly, which is absolutely unbelievable, 46% of Americans cannot come up with $400 for an emergency. It's unthinkable. We are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And we have a scenario of that situation. We also have to address the issue uh, of what's going on in relation to how campaigns are funded. We need to deal with what's called the 28th Amendment. We need to say we can no longer have politicians and corporations buying elections. We, we literally are losing our democracy. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is disappearing. So just to sum this up, we have to ensure, we need to elect people that ultimately represent your interests. So I don't want to get to it, but if you look at some people in this room, they've raised a million dollars. Ask that question. If you raise a million dollars from out of state, what does that mean? So all I ask you guys to do is look at who's beholden to do, to whom, when it comes to this election. Thank you very much. The next question is about campaign finance reform. So if you want to talk about income inequality, that would be great. But I really, because there's a lot of parts to the campaign finance Parents. Uh, <clears throat> So when it comes to income inequality, of course there could be an entire semester in college on that. There's books written on it. But let me talk about three things. First of all, we have to have a not-for-profit universal health care system. So that means it's going to, your, your um, health care is going to be transformable. And what does that mean? There's a lot of people who are stuck in jobs right now that they don't want because they need the health care. There are people who want to start their own businesses, but they can't do it because they don't have health care. And there are people, this is true, they are stuck in abusive relationships that they can't leave because their, their partner is the one who provides them with their health care. So this is your quality of life up and down, having universal health care coverage. But secondly, and this is something that people really need to think about, why do we allow products to be sold in America that are made under labor conditions that would be illegal in our country? Think about what these international corporations have done, who have fealty to no nations, they only have fealty to the bottom line. What they have done is create a workaround around the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment would ban slavery in our country, right? Ban slave labor. What they've done is say, well, China doesn't ban slave labor. China doesn't ban prison labor. These other countries don't do it. So us, this American, so-called American company is simply going to buy their products from those countries and sell them here in America at a cost that's so low that no American company can compete. If we ban products made by slave labor in this country, our manufacturing base would return. Because those products, the need for those products haven't gone away. What's gone away is the ability of these corporations to make the most profit possible. So those little widgets and, and uh, stuff that people buy, like Levy who shop at Walmart, um, if those were made in America, then you wouldn't have these problems. And finally, the corporate tax rate being a flat 22% is totally ridiculous. A corporation from dollar zero to dollar infinity is taxed at 22%. There, and that's before the lawyers and their accountants get involved. These corporations need to pay their fair share. Set for a long time, the middle class is stumbling and the poor have fallen. The Republican majority in Congress prioritizes putting all of the money back into the pockets of their wealthy donors. In 2011, Senator Coburn produced a pamphlet showing the subsidies of the rich and famous. Our tax code 
just transfers all of our hard-earned money into the pockets of the millionaires and billionaires. And this last tax bill made it even worse. Joe Biden said, show me your budget and I'll tell you your values. The Republicans in the Congress right now are so out of line with our values. I'll tell you, our office fought really hard. We wanted teachers to be able to deduct $250 because every year the teachers pay so much out of money out of pocket for their, for their supplies. The House Republicans stripped it out. But if you own a private yacht or if you own a private jet or own a golf course, they kept those subsidies in there. They kept those deductions. Those are their values. You know, families just want to pay their bills, take care of their families, and have a little money left over for pizza on Friday night. We can do better, we can make this tax code fair, and we can solve this issue of in income inequality in our country. Thank you. This time is about family leave when you have a child, child care assistance when your children are in school, equal pay when you enter the workforce, the opportunity to join a union if you want to join a union and not be intimidated by corporations who are trying to rip the lake up from under us, uh, make sure that you have health care, make sure that the social security system is safe, give you the opportunity to have a pension which corporations have ripped out of the hands of most people in this country, and now that they've done that, they want to go after social security and Medicare, the only thing that's holding many people up in this country and so, all the way up, and let me say this, I have fought for child care benefits, for health care workers, for health care at the bargaining table at the state legislature. I have fought for equal pay, wrote the New Hampshire equal pay bill, and made sure the governor signed it, and she turned around and gave me the pen. I fought for Social Security and Medicare. I have been in this fight for years, and I have created change. Nobody on this podium can say that. I created change for 40 years. So you can talk about what you'd like to do. I hope that you take a look at what I have done and give some credit to the work that we've done together to make this a better state and a better country. Thank you. Okay, um, this is a uh, multi faceted question. It's all the same stuff. Um, the first part of it, which everyone will be able to do, is going to be Director Levy first, but then the going to be fully to the Levy with some show of campaign money. So that's all about campaign budgets. Um, so two of the questions were regarding uh, uh, constitutional amendment and overturning Citizens United to make sure that it applies to people only. That's part of it. So that's what it is. But this other person uh, wants to show of hands. Have you? Uh, have you not accepted, and will you pledge to not accept any corporate donations to your campaign? So everyone who has not accepted any corporate donations and will not accept any, please raise your hand. I know what Then we got a tricky question, of course, because this is Carol County, right? Uh, <clears throat> I tried to figure out how to word this the easiest. Um, have you not accepted today, and will you pledge not to accept any donations outside of donors from existing in the first congressional district one? Okay. Anyone willing to lift only donations from congressional district one? Nobody. Outside of New Hampshire? Nobody. Okay. Have you accepted any contributions from anyone or any entity outside of the state of New Hampshire? So, start with Levy about overturning Citizens United and why that's the most important issue to address all of these other issues because of Levy. Well, I think I made it very, very clear that it's absolutely unacceptable. I'm probably one of the few people who understand this issue better than almost anybody. Um, on a 5 and 4 decision, the United States Supreme Court decided that corporations are people. I know Lincoln Soldati disagrees, obviously, thinks it's a very serious problem, and it is. Um, but one of the things I want to let you know is we're, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, a vast majority of people believe in ending Citizens United. 85% of Republicans. 
So if you look overall, that's a really, really important point. But I also want to get to, I want to take the, the uh, I know, um, in terms of Walmart. I go to Walmart to campaign, to talk about what's going on with low income and working class people. People can laugh at that, but that's what's going on. What's going on right now, ultimately, is that people increasingly are having a hard time making ends meet. And people actually in Walmart, we are subsidizing Walmart. We have a situation where people make so little money that they have to be on food stamps. That is simply unacceptable. We need to have a $15 minimum wage. And contrary to what people say, it's not acceptable. It's not community college. Tuition free public colleges and universities. That is what we need. It's not, it's not a debate. Uh, we, we, it's really just an extraordinary situation. So again, the 28th Amendment is absolutely essential. Once we get rid of uh, Citizens United, we will be able to bring politics back to the people. One person, one vote. Thank you very much. So, just, we're getting close, and this is when I become everyone's least favorite person in the world. So, so far, uh, a majority of the folks have already answered four times, except for Terrence, uh, Douglas, and Mark. Douglas has? Okay, so Terrence and Mark. Okay, so I'm going to give you first dibs from now on for many of the questions. So, Terrence or Mark, do you want to? Want it? Yeah. Terrence. <coughs> So when it comes to campaign finance reform, of course, you know, you, we, Citizens United should be overturned. Um, and of course, we should have an amendment to, to make that happen. But that's easier said than done. I don't think we're going to get three quarters of the states to agree on anything at this point. We couldn't get everyone to agree on the color of the sky. So that means the onus falls on us as voters. And like I've been saying, the day of the lazy voter is over. And I include myself in that category. I've done the same thing anyone else has done. If you get close to an, uh, an election, even if you're a committed Democrat and the primary's coming up and you know you say, oh, well, you know, I, re I remember that person's father or mother or husband, and oh, I remember that name, that brand name, or, or oh, yeah, that, that guy, his dad owned the gas station down the street. And then you vote for him for that reason. Well, that's not good enough. All of us have websites now. All of us have Facebook pages, all of us have Twitter, all of us come to events like this. So as a voter, what you need to do, your, your basic job as a citizen, go to these Facebook pages, find out where people stand on the issues. But more importantly, find out what stands they're not taking on issues. Or you come to events like this and you find out who is not for Medicare for all, who's not in favor of legalization of marijuana. And then your second step is to go to the Federal Election Commission website, fbc.gov, and each and every one of us have our financial filings on there. And you're going to see that people on there are taking money from particular industries, but also from what are called political action committees. And let me tell you how you get money from a political action committee. They send you a questionnaire and want you to agree with them on certain questions. And then at the end, they make you sign a pledge saying that you will vote in the interest of this organization. And then they give you money. In any other setting, that would be bribery. <laughs> so anyone who's taking money from a PAC, you know that they have swore an oath of allegiance to a third party before they swore an oath of allegiance to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And as a voter, if you want to see these things change, don't vote for people who've already sold you out. Thank you. Uh, when I was asked if I take out the state money, my, my brother and sister gave me money. They're in Massachusetts. So I hope that's okay. Let me, say, let, me, let me just say about, about the attack on tax funds. We all get we all get this kind of thing. I I would support public campaign financing. I think it's the answer for our country. It will allow more people to participate in the system than we currently have, because the, the hard thing about being a candidate is raising money. I don't like it. I don't think anybody up here likes it, but that's a reality. My money is not coming from the corporations. The PAC money that I receive oh, comes from the nickels and dimes of working families who give a nickel an hour or a dime an hour to make sure that their voices are heard and to make sure that their candidates can move forward. There's too much money in politics. It's stealing our democracy. It's taking us, it's, it's getting in the way of everything we're trying to do in America. But let me say this. I beat the right to work 17 times in New Hampshire. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to defeat us. 
We beat it when the Republicans were in charge. We beat it when the Democrats were in charge. We beat it because we know how to do the work on the ground. And that's what we have to learn again, how to get up, how to stand up, how to fight again, and how to be Democrats in this election cycle. We're never gonna have more money than them. They'll always have more money than, than us, but they don't have this. We can, with our little finger, change the course of the United States, and the, and the saying is, if the 99% participate, the 1% won't matter. So let's make sure that we do that in South Carolina. I really care about this issue. Okay. Been practicing campaign finance reform since 2006, long before Citizens United. National Dems thought that we were crazy. A lot of them still think we are. They think it's like showing up at a fight with an arm tied behind our back. But we've done it. We have won this district time and time and again, one of the toughest districts in this country. We've always said we want people to come to us with the biggest policy ideas, not their biggest checks. I collapsed on the couch in the congressional office in 2010 when Citizens United was decided. I said that we couldn't begin to fathom what this would mean for our democracy. And I was right. The cesspool of dark money, no transparency, is a grave threat to our democracy. And we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. Do you know we both we know that both Republicans and Democrats think that this is one of our biggest problems? But there is only one Republican in Congress right now who consistently signs on to let to any legislation to deal with this issue. We need to win this seat and we need to win a House majority that prioritizes this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Citizens United, let's be clear, is one of the worst things that's happened to our country in the last 20 years. It is a fundamental threat to our democracy. And you know, Mark mentioned this a minute ago, and I agree with him. He said, as a candidate, raising the resources for a campaign, it's not how, I, and I would never speak for another candidate, but it's not how I'd like to spend my time. I don't think it's how anyone wants to spend our time. But we're running in a district that's gone back and forth and the Koch brothers and the NRA are going to throw a lot of money at the seat. And that's just what it takes. But we've got to have a bipartisan amendment to overturn Citizens United. And that is one of the things, first things I would be focused on as a member of Congress. I have pledged not to take a dime from the NRA and not to take a dime of corporate PAC money. But we've got to overturn Citizens United. Thank you. Second question. Since the U.S. entered World War II, it seems that uh, one area upon which both major parties can agree is maintaining foreign military presence in war and nations all over the world, uh, even when the U.S. Uh, has not been attacked. What role do you believe the U.S. military should play in the world today? Third question. I have an older brother who is in the Army and has served in Iraq. What will you do as a member of Congress to ensure that if he is sent to war again, it is for a just cause and the country will take care of him when he returns? Yeah, so I'm one of those veterans that were mentioned that question. I was a paratrooper in the United States Army and I served a tour in Iraq as an advisor to an Iraqi infantry battalion. I've seen the worst of humanity. We killed one million people in that country in a war that never should have been fought. And the number one issue that illuminated my entire campaign is ending the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And everyone says, you know, on the first day I'm gonna do this, on the first day I'm gonna do that. The first bill I will submit is a bill to deauthorize the authorization for use of military force in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And that will not only end those two wars, it will end all the proxy wars that have grown out of those. 
What those bills have done is allow people to go into Syria, go into Niger, go anywhere they want to do. And what it also has done is perverted our American system. Our American system was based on getting rid of this, the, the unitary power that the King of England had. The King of England raised armies, raised navies, decided how we're going to pay for them, and decided where we're going to fight. We separated those. We said Congress declares war, Congress raises armies and navy, and the president is the head general and the head, uh, the head admiral, and he executes policy. Right now, because of these authorizations, the president decides who the terrorists are, and the president decides where we're going to send military force. We just had an incursion into Syria that was 100% and totally illegal. He should be impeached for that and that alone. So I commit to you that I will never support sending American troops overseas unless it is for a declaration of war. We have, been, we have not had a declaration of war since World War II, but we have been at war constantly since World War II. And it's time for Congress to reclaim its authority and declare war, and it's time for America to stop being the world's bully. Thank you. is enormous. We are in the trillions, not billions, not millions, but the trillions. And that money is not being set aside. There are no new taxes to pay for that life or raised during the other wars, the major conflicts in the world. None of this is being paid for. And so we have a giant credit card that keeps accumulating all of this, all of this debt for us. And what is that doing for us? It's going to take away our future and undermine our ability to do all of the other things that we want to do in this country. We want better schools, we want better infrastructure, we want higher pay, we want social security stabilized, we want Medicare, we want all of these things. But when the majority of the budget is committed, is committed to defense, then we can't have what we want. And I don't think America right now wants to be fighting wars all over the world. It's killing our people. It's bleeding out our, the, the energy and the money and the resources of our nation. Let Congress do their job. Let Congress take the responsibility for coming up and, and do their job, which they have never done. They haven't done this even though they're authorized to do that. They have a responsibility to make sure that we're in, that we're in war, they approve them. To make sure that they're paid for. And to make sure that the people who are in wars, when they come home, are taken care of with a system in VA hospitals all over the United States that takes care of our veterans, unlike what we're doing today. Thank you. As I uh, noted in my opening, I have opposed uh, every war uh, since Vietnam, when I first began uh, protesting wars, uh, and that includes the current wars that we're involved in. Uh, and, uh, you know, my father was a veteran, uh, I was a vet, I have a son uh, who's a vet, uh, he served uh, in the uh, 82nd Airborne out of Fort Bragg, did tour in uh, Afghanistan and uh, elsewhere in uh, Northern Africa. I think it was the, the, the worst months I've spent in my life wondering whether or not we were gonna get that knock on the door. The fact of the matter is, uh, as been mentioned, the responsibility to declare war is on Congress. And unfortunately, we have a Congress right now that has abandoned so many of its obligations, particularly its constitutional obligations. And we shouldn't be in any war where Congress hasn't declared and also fully funded and uh, transparently funded. Uh, we now operate on the basis of carte blanche uh, by the Commander-in-Chief, uh, or in our case, I guess it would be the Drifter-in-Chief. Uh, and uh, 
you know, this has to change. It has to change with Congress taking back its constitutional responsibility. We have to hold Congress accountable. And you do that by not simply going along with business as usual. And, uh, and unfortunately, that's been the name of the game. You know, Eisenhower is the one who warned uh, this country about the military industrial complex. But the original speech was the warning about the military industrial congressional con uh, complex. And that was removed from the speech at the last minute. So until we do that, we're not going to see any change. So it's time to put different ideas into Congress. Thank you. The United States cannot be the world's police. We just can't do it anymore. It's just, it's just unbelievable. But what we need to understand, if somebody does go to war, particularly veterans, they need to be treated with respect and dignity, as well as giving uh, the proper, what, what they're doing in terms of the veterans, we're not putting enough money in terms of all these veterans. I was, I was in Tilton and I, I talked to a lot of folks, uh, a lot of veterans, and it's just, it's just unconscionable the way in which we put so much money into war, but then when folks come back with PTSD, with traumatic brain injuries, a whole sort of other issues, we somehow forget about these folks, these men and women who fought uh, for our, our right uh, to live in a free uh, democracy. Uh, and I just think it's so extraordinarily important you know, that we understand very clearly that the United States is encouraging uh, terrorism, and we need to radically change that. We need to say enough is enough, and we, and we need to say ultimately that our men and women deserve the best veterans administration that they can have, and that we get the most qualified folks that we can possibly get. Because it's hard to imagine in terms of what, uh, if you look at what Maura has done in terms of the work that she's done in so many different ways, uh, as well as Terrence. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's amazing, uh, you know. I, when, I, when I play paintball, I get a little bit nervous. Uh, so I can tell you, I've, I've shot a lot of guns, uh, but I've never been shot at. And that is a whole different ball game. So I just hope we understand that we really, really uh, owe it to our men and women uh, who, who, who fought uh, for this great country of ours uh, to do everything we can to uh, help out uh, the Veterans better Administration. Thank you very much. talking about right now is transportation as it relates to that. We got to be able to have transportation from Boston to Manchester so that we can pull those folks up here right now. That's simply the, the easiest way that we're going to be able to bring more people up. Secondly, when it comes to education, we got to be talking about that in a way that ties back to high school. Now, anybody here, can anybody get an electrician? Tomorrow, if you needed one, show of hands. No one? You can? Sir, are you related to an electrician? Are you an electrician? <laughs> so we got to be talking about the jobs that are available here right now. And if we get more people working, we're going to be able to allow more businesses to flourish. Small businesses need customers. And in order to allow customers to buy from small businesses, we need to be able to pay those employees enough to be able to shop at those stores. They are all interrelated, we gotta get back to education. When I was talking earlier, I, I, I had mentioned the fact that, that education, when it comes to computer science, is something that we're not doing near enough of. And that's true. If we could graduate everybody here from high school with the ability to go after a computer science, career, we would be able to say New Hampshire is a destination. And I would like to go get Title II money and bring it back to New Hampshire to re-educate our teachers so that we could actually graduate everybody in high school with the ability to go after a job 
and computer science. Because then maybe in the in the valley we'd be able to attract businesses that are just attracted to our ability to have computer science ready candidates. Thank you. Chris. Well, thank you. You know, I addressed a few components of this, but I think just stepping back for a minute, the problem that we face as a state in terms of attracting young workers and retaining them is really felt acutely here. So this is a specific problem um, that you know the whole state deals with, but is, this is ground zero uh, for what we're seeing in terms of workforce concerns. Um, I think that a few of the proposals that I mentioned before are really important. We've got to work on the affordable housing crisis, and that involves increasing funding for home and for the CDBG program, also increasing the low-income tax credit for housing uh, that exists um, and that uh, needs to be expanded so that more people can access it. I think we also have to ensure that we work hard to make sure that higher education is affordable and that people can stay right here in New Hampshire and not uh, go to college and be priced out of it here in the Granite State. You know, I've talked to lots of local businesses. I know Dave and Val just left from Loop and Pet. Uh, visited with them. I visited at the you know Red Jack, the um, I'm sorry Red Parka today, and uh, talked with the owner about the lack of uh, young people that are readily available to join her workforce. She's working now every Saturday waitressing, three nights a week as well during the summers when things get really crazy around here. And so there are a lot of businesses and business owners that are hustling here. Um, the J-1 program is important, expanding H-2B visas so that the foreign seasonal workers can come in, uh, particularly for the tourism industry is important, but nothing takes the place of ensuring that we have um, the young, talented people right here in New Hampshire wanting to stay here. Um, and I think we've got to continue to work on those pipelines from the community colleges and public universities and make sure people are trained up um, in the industries that need help. And there are a lot that need help right up here, and I will be uh, working hard on this to help facilitate that as much as I can. I think we need a member of Congress who is steeped in these issues and who is very present in this part of the district, and that's what I commit to you to do. Thank you. I'm not going to shoot me. So, uh, this is a 10 second answer, just the name, and that's it. What was the last book you read? <laughs> I'm currently reading a book called Bobby about Bobby Kennedy. Oh. Citizens of London about our governor went mm -hmm. Small Town Big Oil about the fight of my supporter Dudley Dudley against the oil refinery on Great Bay. The New York Times of Boston Globe. No, that's <laughs> a memoir called Educated. Uh, Dreamland about uh, the heroin trade. I'm reading Bobby as well about uh, Bobby Kennedy. And Alan Dershowitz, autobiography. Great, thank you, Alan. And thank you all. Um, <laughs> First of all, again, let me thank everybody. This is what democracy is about, and I really appreciate you guys coming here and listening to different views and ideas. You know, I, I really look at this uh, election uh, about consequences in, in terms of in, in, in differing uh, your, your perspectives in terms of what's going on. I think Medicare for All is absolutely essential. Uh, if you look ultimately in terms of uh, 2020, who's going to be running for president? Increasingly, everybody understands that Medicare for All is what it's about. But Medicare for All is more complicated than people think it is, because as people know, if you if you look at in terms of medi in terms of Medicare, you have a scenario where ultimately that folks who are older can't can't get their um, their hearing aids, they can't get their vision checked, they can't get their glasses, uh, they can't have dental care. Dental care is a huge, huge, huge problem uh, in this country. So I think you know, obviously essential for me. Sort of that if I'm in Congress, I'm going to fight definitively to ensure that that's, that's essential in terms of Medicare. And then the issue in terms of tuition-free public colleges and universities, absolutely essential. Not only is it the right thing to do, but it makes economic sense. The fact is, if somebody has a college education compared to a high school education, they're going to make a lot more money. Also, we need to ensure that folks do not want to go to college, have the opportunity to go to technical schools, and do it for free. The other issue, as I said very clearly, is paid equity for women. 
women on average make 79 cents to a dollar. That's outrageous. For African American Latino women, it's actually 56 cents a dollar. Paid family and medical leave have a situation, as you know right now, that in the state of New Hampshire, that we don't, that, that the folks don't get paid. If, if they ultimately decide to take, uh, you know, paid family and medical leave, they're lucky if they get their job back. So we need, we need to change that. So the bottom line here in this situation, you guys have to very quickly just look at all the differences and make a determination who's the best person. Thank you very much. Thank you again all for coming. I think it says a lot about our community, the state of our country, that so many people are here. You know, I think like all of us, I'm worried when I look around our country. I think we all should be worried. But I'm also very hopeful because it's June and this room's packed. And we have done this before. We're the country that elected Barack Obama. We sent Barack Obama and Michelle Obama to the White House. We're the country that did that. We're the state that expanded Medicaid. And every single person in this room had a role in making that happen. As I said, I think we all should be worried when we look around the country. And there is so much at stake in this election. And let's just be clear what is at stake in this election. Healthcare is on the ballot in this election. Gun violence is on the ballot in this election. Women's rights are on the ballot in this election. That is what is at stake in November. So thank you all for coming and being a part of this. And I'm here to ask for your support and ask for your vote to go and fight for you and fight for your families and advocate for our community in Washington at this critical time in our country. Thank you. You know, for the last year and a half, I've gone to bed every night thinking to myself, it can't possibly get any worse. <laughs> and then I'd make the mistake of getting up in the morning and turn on the news, and guess what? It got worse. I mean, name your issue. Climate change, it got worse. Women's rights, it got worse. Worse. Gun control, health care, economic inequality, immigration, you name it. It just got worse. Donald Trump represents the greatest threat to our democracy since World War II. Fundamental to our Constitution, indeed the genius of our Constitution, is the concept of checks and balances. But unfortunately, Congress has abandoned its constitutional mandate and left us with an administration that is unchecked and unbalanced. An administration that promised to drain the swamp, but instead restocked it. Uh, one cabinet position after another is filled with corporate anti-science, anti-education, anti-environment acts. In this administration, incompetence isn't a disqualifier, it's a requirement. It's not enough just to talk about our beliefs and values. We need to act. We have to offer real solutions not rhetoric. We must become the party of action, not condemnation. The time for us to act is now. I'm running because I can no longer sit on the sidelines and watch the systemic destruction of my country and the principles on which it stands. As the oldest candidate in this race, I'm not running to build a political career. I'm running to make a difference now. I hope you'll join me in this fight. I humbly ask for your support and your vote. My name is Lincoln Soldati, and I'm running for Congress. Thank you. Thank you again, Ray and Carroll County Dems, and everyone from, for coming out tonight. A writer at the, Hush, at the Huffington Post once referred to our office as one of the hardest working. We earned that. I promise to keep that tradition of hard work and service alive. This is a tough district. It's 25% registered Dem, 35% registered Republican, and the rest are undeclared. We won this district in 2016, and Trump won this district in 2016. We can't take this general election for granted. We were the first Dem to hold the seat in close to 30 years in 2006, and the work that we've done over the years has earned us the respect and the trust and the support of the voters in this district. I was in D.C. in 2007 when Dems won the majority for the first time in 12 years. We had an aggressive legislative agenda, and it was a lot. I am cautiously optimistic that we will win the House majority this November, and we will need an even more aggressive agenda to undo the harm that's been done by this administration and the Republican majority. 
New Hampshire will be well served with someone who has no learning curve and who can hit the ground running on day one. I know the issues, I will have an experienced team in place, and I have the personal relationships with people in every town and community in New Hampshire's first district and in Congress on both sides of the aisle to get right to work. I promise to be a tireless advocate for the people of this district, and if you do give me the privilege of representing you, you have my commitment that I will work every day to make life better for the rest of us. I hope you'll follow me at NaomiAndrews.com, and I hope you'll join the team. This is a grassroots, people-powered campaign. We are the people we've been waiting for. I hope to earn your vote on primary day, September 11th. Thank you. Now, I've been accused from time to time of acting like a fire captain and being a little corrupt and a little rough at times. <laughs> but the reality is that I feel very passionate about these issues that I care about. You know, I entered community service a long time ago. My entire life has been about my dedication to community service, uh, and it continued after the FLCO, it continued after the fire department and in the legislature, and this is an extension, this next step is an extension of all of that work. You know, when firefighters came to me and they said, you know, we are getting cancer, I wrote and passed the cancer bill in New Hampshire. When people came to me and firefighters said we need better education because we're getting hurt in fire stations and, and fires, I, I, I worked with the coalition of people and we established the fire again. When unemployed, when buildings were being closed and workers were stuck in the street, I passed the one notification law to make sure people in New Hampshire, did, if their shop closed, they, had, they were protected. And so this is a record of accomplishment and service and it's something that I have done, and I think I'm the most qualified person to do this because of my background, my history, my passion, and my commitment. And I promise you that I'm not going to back down, sit down, or walk away from any fight if I'm fighting on your behalf in the Congress of the United States. I never have backed down. I never will back down. And that's why we defeated Right to Work 17 times in New Hampshire, and we're going to defeat Donald Trump, we're going to defeat the Republicans that don't care about our country and don't care about where we're going as a nation. I'm Mark McKenzie, and I'm running for Congress. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for being a part of this discussion today. This is really great. You know, as a local business owner, I've never thought you could run government like a business, but I think President Trump's proving me wrong because he's running this government just like he ran one of his Atlantic City casinos yeah. with no ethics giving workers and businesses the shaft, and we're all gonna end up bankrupt at the end of it if we're not careful. This is why we need, desperately, a check and a balance right now, and we can only achieve that through a Democratic Congress, and that's why I'm running for this office. I have a record of a proven progressive at the State House who's taken up a number of the big fights over the last several years, and I think I'm ready for this challenge, uh, to win a tough district that's flipped back and forth five of the last six elections, not by backing away from what I believe in, but by standing firm on it and by reaching out to those in the middle and on the other side who we need to bring along to win this particular seat. Look, we're running a campaign that's of, by, and for the people of New Hampshire. We need someone in this seat who understands the needs of the people of the state, who shares the values of the people of the Granite State, and who's gonna work like heck over the course of this campaign and over the next two years to provide the type of leadership that people of this state are asking for. We're putting together a strong effort. I'm proud of the support that we have in this part of the state and all across the district. Uh, we have the support of the majority of state representatives, state senators, mayors. Uh, we have the support of my friend, Senator Maggie Hassan. Organized labor as well is behind us. But to be honest, the support we're most interested in earning in this campaign is yours. And that's why we're here. That's why we're gonna be coming back early and often. That's why we're gonna have a robust operation where we're gonna to talk to voters on their doorsteps, on the phones and coffee shops, wherever we can find them. That's how we're gonna win this seat this fall. We're battle tested and ready to go. And I hope you'll join our effort so that we can make sure that we have a progressive, succeeding Carol shaped order, carrying that torch forward for the middle class families and Main Street businesses that call this state home. Thanks so much. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody, for coming out here tonight. This gives me a lot of hope that everybody's here tonight. What doesn't give me a lot of hope is when I read that millennials still view Republicans as stewards of the economy. In fact, I think that most of us probably in our hearts 
recognize that as Democrats, we might sacrifice some economic growth for fairness. But I want to I want to say clearly tonight, there is no economic growth without fairness. There is no way that everybody can get a seat at the table without fairness, and we need everybody with a seat at the table in order to grow this economy and provide for everyone else. But what happens is we don't see it. We don't see government doing anything but a failing school and a crumbling bridge and a higher tax bill. Who wants more of that kind of government? No one. But the problem is, as Democrats too often, we've been reading polls. We read polls and, and when it gets to 54%, we jump behind it. And then we're all in favor of it. Our job as Democrats is not to read polls. Our job as Democrats is to go out and change polls. That's why I believe in a Medicare for all system, a single payer system, that's going to allow everybody the opportunity to start a business, grow a business, leave a company for another job. But we need to all be talking about that. Because maybe then we're going to start convincing the next generation that government can do things again. Government is us. And maybe we'll remember that government is us instead of some distant force. But I'll, I'll close with thanking you for being a part of this government tonight and showing up. Because with nine or eight candidates at the table, it's clear that we are not the most important part of the government. You guys out in the room showing up every single day are. So thank you for showing up and keep showing up. So uh, just as a plug, I'll be holding my first virtual town hall tomorrow night on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. So please visit my table out there to get all the uh, official particulars on how you find me on Facebook. And it's been mentioned several times already is that this district is not a Democratic district. Donald Trump won this district in 2016. And Carol Shea Porter barely won. She got 44% of the vote against a sleazebag criminal from Manchester and a carpetbagger from Ohio. So this district is tough for us. So winning in September doesn't mean anything, and that's you can win in November. And I have the profile that fits this district and can win in this district. As I've already mentioned, I'm a combat veteran. I conducted over 120 mounted and dismounted patrols in Iraq, for which I was awarded the Bronze Star Medal and the Combat Action Badge. During the course of my legal career, I've served as an assistant United States attorney, where I was part of the counterterrorism, counterespionage, and counterproliferation team. And I'm a hunter, and I'm a gun owner. So the normal tropes that they use against Democrats are what? We're un-American. We're wimpy. We're cowardly. Those can't be used against me. Matter of fact, I dare them to say that to me. And there isn't a room in this state I can't go into and talk about these tough issues because I have that credibility. So what I'm asking you is to support me not only in September, but remember November. Onward to victory in November. Thank you.